The Roman Gladius, the sword that built the great empire of the ancient world. Even today, thousands of years later, the Gladius is still associated with power and imperium. Together with the Scutum Shield, this blade brought the Mediterranean to heel and subdued the peoples of Europe under Italian rule. But in spite of its publicity and popularity, this sword is surprisingly misunderstood. Welcome to the Knife Life. Today, we are going to be delving into the Gladius Short Sword, what it is and what its true origins are. Let's get into it. So what exactly is the Gladius Sword of Rome? That's a surprisingly difficult question to answer, as there isn't one exact profile that makes a Gladius. In fact, the word Gladius translates directly to sword and could be used to describe any blade of suitable size. The most recognizable Gladius looks pretty close to this. The Gladius is always a one-handed short sword with a straight blade, double edges, and a long tapering tip intended for thrusting. Aside from that, there can be quite a bit of variation between the blades. Overall length could vary from blade to blade, but none really exceeded 28 inches. The Gladius typically made use of a through tang with a three-part grip, the guard, the grip itself, and the pommel. Many times, the guard would have a copper alloy plate placed over the wooden guard in order to provide additional protection. The grip itself was regularly carved with finger grooves to improve the comfort and weapon retention. The pommel was then pinned into place to secure the handle furniture. Gladii are often categorized into a number of different categories. The first is the Gladius Hispaniensis. These are theorized to be the oldest Gladii featuring rounded shoulders instead of square ones and a blade with a wasted profile, tapering down towards the center of the blade and widening again before coming to a point. It is often theorized that the Gladius Hispaniensis, so named in the ancient histories, originated in Iberia and was adopted by the Romans. Another type is the Mines Gladius, like this one. This category is typified by a blade excavated near the city of Mines, Germany. These blades greatly retain most of the features of the previous Gladius Hispaniensis, but are shorter and only very slightly wasted. A third category is the Fulham Gladius, almost identical to the mines, except for a sharply triangular point instead of the curved tip of the mines. The fourth category is called the Pompeii Gladius and is based on a sword recovered from the famous lost city. Often among the shortest of blades, the Pompeii features parallel edges, discarding the previous wasp-waisted blades of before. The Pompeii also features a shorter version of the triangular tip of the Fulham Gladius. It is typically represented that these blades evolved in this order, starting with the Gladius Hispaniensis around the 2nd century BC and evolving to the Pompeii until the Gladius's widespread replacement with the longer Spatha sword. The overall story of the Gladius is that it was adopted from the Celtic people in Iberia and replaced the Xiphos, the previous sword adopted by the Romans but recent research has indicated that this may not have been what actually happened. The new story of how the Gladius came to be starts in Italy, and we have to make our way all the way back to the Bronze Age to begin. The first swords to be found in Italy can be traced back to the Middle Bronze Age around about 1500 BC. These blades were just that, only the blades. A short piece of tang was what a grip would be riveted to in order to provide a finished sword. As you can imagine, this left something to be desired in regards to the blade's durability. This form of construction relegated such blades to predominantly thrusting and limited the length these blades could be made. By 1200 BC, construction methods had improved with the development of tangs that allowed for sturdier grips to be made and promoted the cutting use of these blades. As a result, the majority of cultures on the European continent began to favor cutting weapons. The central Italian peoples, in contrast, continued to favor the thrust during the transition into the Iron Age around 1000 BC. Italian swords began to decrease in size by about a third during this time. 
In the 8th century BC, the city of Rome became the center of regional power in the Latin world. Of particular importance was Rome's commercial influence between northern and southern Italy. The evolution of Rome was followed by the evolution of Roman culture and the creation of the monarchy. During the monarchical period, the first large-scale organized legions came into being, utilizing the triple line of soldiers consisting of the Trarii in the front, Principe in the middle, and Hestasi in the rear. Unlike many other armies of the time, the Roman army focused on the sword as their primary arm as opposed to the spear. One iron sword in particular developed by the end of the 7th century BC as the common arm of the Romans. It featured a wasted blade with a long tapering point of about 20 inches with a built-in crossguard and grip of complex manufacture. These grips would make use of a tang sandwiched between two scales of wood and bone or some other material. Then, metal would be formed over the top of both sides of the grip, and the whole assembly would be pinned into place. This represented a far superior weapon than had been previously available, but was not particularly easy to mass produce. This blade is commonly described as the Xiphos and is thought to be of Greek origin, but there really isn't much evidence to support that theory. The Xiphos, or crossguard sword, can be dated back to the end of the 7th century BC, and has been found in many burial sites in Italy from this time period. Within the next half a century, the crossguard sword became much more numerous. This makes sense as the Romans had adopted the sword as the main weapon for their infantry. In comparison, the crossguard sword doesn't really seem to appear in Greece until the 6th century. The main arm of the Hellenic armies was that of the dory or spear. Military doctrine took the form of the hoplite phalanx, where the sword was only used as the last means of defense. A recent analysis of Greek pottery during this area revealed the obvious secondary nature of the sword. Not only were swords depicted far less often, but the crossguard sword was not depicted until the 6th century BC. Even during the 5th century BC, the crossguard sword is not a common weapon depicted, losing out to more common blades such as the Machiara. This is supported by the small number of crossguard swords archaeologists have found in Greece. While it certainly was present, it wasn't a preeminent weapon. In reality, it's impossible to definitively prove that the Xiphos did not originate in Greece, but based upon its rarity in Hellenic lands and its prevalence in Latin lands, a strong case can be made that the crossguard sword originated from Italian roots. Taking this into account, as well as the wasted blade shape of the sword and its size, one can consider the crossguard sword to be the first Roman gladius. In 509 BC, the Roman monarch Tequinius Superbus was deposed and the Roman Senate took power. In place of a single head of state, the Senate appointed consuls to govern for a set period of time before being replaced. During the consulate period, the Roman military progressively moved away from seasonal soldiery to a full-time professional fighting force. The Romans would find themselves fighting unfamiliar foes such as the Goths and Celts. Celtic culture had already begun to influence Rome by the 6th century BC, including their weapons. This began to shift Roman swords away from the crossguard sword gladius to the more familiar shape of the consulate gladius. These early consulate gladii discarded the grip construction of the previous monarchical blades and adopted a through tang construction common in Celtic blades. Additionally, the three-part grip previously mentioned was implemented, greatly simplifying manufacturing. While the three-part grip was adopted from Celtic blades, the Roman version is visibly different. Whereas Celtic blades exhibited a V-shaped guard, smooth grip, and stylized pommel, the Romans utilized a hemispherical guard, a grooved grip, and a spherical pommel. Additionally, where Celtic blades have concave shoulders connecting to the tang, Roman blades made use of convex shoulders. The closed formations the Romans had developed favored shorter blades, as each man was expected to occupy only three feet of space in the front of the line, limiting the usefulness of larger blades. The shorter wasted blade was retained from the late crossguard sword as a result. The resulting sword is what is now commonly referred to as the gladius hispaniensis. Until recently, 
it has been widely accepted that the gladius was of Iberian origin, largely due to the name Hispaniensis. However, this story doesn't quite stand up under scrutiny. Historical accounts clearly reference the gladius Hispaniensis, but what often isn't taken into account is that the word Hispaniensis refers to a resident but not a native of Spain, whereas the word Hispanis refers to a native Spaniard. All references that originated in Latin made this subtle distinction. The sources that are often referenced to support the Spanish sword theory, however, were originally in Greek, which does not make the same distinction as Latin. But so what? What happens in Spain apparently arms the Roman army and takes over the known Western world. Well, an interesting fact is that during this time period, the Spanish region had become well known for its metalworking and high quality iron from its mines. During the Second Punic War, Iberia was a high value strategic asset. The Romans seized this territory from the Carthaginians and put it to their own use. Warfare at the time often involved the sacking and looting of captured cities, devastating the defeated population. But the capture of Nova Carthago in 209 BC was different. Instead, the Romans permitted the majority of the population to go about their lives under Roman occupation, while the artisans would be made public slaves with the promise of their freedom if the war ended favorably for the Romans. These highly skilled new slaves were put to the task of crafting weapons for the Roman army under the watch of Roman supervisors. It should not be ignored that swords classified as Gladius Hespaniensis are dated back to this time period. It is highly likely that this is the origin of the Gladius Hispaniensis. Rather than being a blade of Spanish origin, it was associated with the foreign Roman style blades that were mass produced in Spain. This is similar to the idea of a Toledo or Solingen sword. The name does not indicate what type of sword it is, but rather indicates a high quality blade due to the reputation of the artisans from those cities. Furthermore, a look at Iberian weapons of the time reveals little similarity between the Iberian swords and their supposed descendant, the Gladius. If it was in fact descended from an Iberian blade, the Romans would have had to been influenced by a particularly rare specimen. Throughout the rest of the consular age, the Gladius saw widespread use. Predominantly blades classified as the Gladius Hispaniensis, the Mines, and the Fulham Gladius are seen in use until at least the 1st century AD. Classification is difficult and in many cases impractical since different models of Gladius were never officially made. Unlike our modern approach to the topic, a sword was just a sword back then. The significant variation in blades can be explained by two things. First, each blade was handmade and hand finished. Second, during the first and second centuries BC, Rome had picked a lot of different fights with a lot of different people in a lot of different areas. Some of these people were the Carthaginians, Celts, Gauls, Germans, Greeks, Armenians, Parthians, Egyptians, and their favorite enemies themselves. Rome endured multiple civil wars, eventually ending in the fall of the Republic and the creation of the Roman Empire. A large part of the variation in blades found in different locations is likely the result of different requirements on that front. Conflicts with the Gauls and Celts were more suitable for the longer gladii with a bit more reach, especially when maneuvering in rough terrain and open formations. Troops engaged in the Roman civil wars, on the other hand, would be locked in tight formations battling against other tight formations. As a result, space would have been a premium and shorter blades would be favored. Around the middle of the first century AD, thinner, shorter blades with completely parallel edges began to emerge. These are the Pompeii style blades mentioned before. While the Pompeii gladii grew in popularity, Older and larger blades from earlier times still found their way into the hands of soldiers routinely. Technological advancement was not as fast as it is today. Two soldiers with a couple hundred years apart would be able to swap their kit and still be effective. Why not keep older blades in service? The Gladius wasn't a particularly romanticized blade, but rather a munitions grade weapon available en masse for the largest scale warfare known up to that time. Interestingly enough though, 
The scabbards and furniture of these blades are often quite ornate. Scabbards were constructed of wood covered in leather, then partially or completely covered in metal plates. One common alloy used to make these plates for the sheaths was orichalcum, a mixture of about 80% copper and 20% zinc. Incidentally, this alloy was also utilized for coinage under the Emperor Augustus in 23 BC. Brass was also used and could be easily coated with tin to replicate the look of silver while being resistant to corrosion. Some sheath plates were embossed with decorative scenes such as religious motifs or Roman victories. These decorations, combined with the brilliant colors of tin, brass, and orichalcum, presented a rather striking presentation. What's particularly interesting is that these weren't only the blades of officers. Swords with these ornate presentations were the property of common soldiers as well. But as becomes everything, the gladius itself fell into a decline. Roman cavalry had never really made use of the gladius, but rather its longer sibling, the spatha. The gladius was too short for effective use from the back of a horse. By the second century AD, the spatha had started superseding the gladius as the infantryman's sword. While the gladius was more compact and suited for close formations, the spatha offered advantages such as longer reach that was more suitable to the new military doctrines being developed. Eventually, the gladius would be phased out completely by the third century AD as Rome moved into the late years of its empire. For those interested in learning more about the Roman gladius, please check out these two books I pulled from heavily. The enthusiasts of the gladius watching this video likely noted that I challenged a lot of conventional knowledge of the gladius. I especially recommend that you check out the book by Fabrizio Casparini and Marco Celiola. A very large portion of this video is based upon their work, which was released only a couple weeks before this video was. Their theories are essentially brand new, but quite compelling. Also, please check out Pierre Serkovich's work as well. He was kind enough to share his photos with us. And he's also making the blade for the upcoming Puggio video. And last but not least, look up Benaya Anderson. He's a good buddy of mine who I recently did a live stream with, and he's the guy who put this Gladius together for me. And if you're interested in this particular blade, this exact one in this video is available for sale. Hit me up with an email if you're interested in purchasing it. As always, stay safe and keep living the knife life.